All right, so um, just a few reminders here, and, um, and I'll actually have this on the next slide as well. So I'm going to get rid of this. Uh, well, maybe I'll leave this up for a second. So um, as I, I did make an announcement, uh, I think today, earlier today, the earlier this morning, that um, uh, I'd gone through and made and it, you know comments on every single assignment D3 that was submitted. And I noticed that some people, um, even though I think there were easy revisions that would get a lot of points back, um, may not have seen those comments. And so I went through and made sure that, uh, that uh, I emailed people that I thought were sort of strange that they didn't uh, have a response. And then also made an announcement that uh, extended that grace period until tomorrow at 10 a.m. So basically through tonight. So if you would like, if, um, you know, if you've already submitted assignment D3, you can go to assignment D3 and look at your submission comments and see if I've left anything for you there to say, uh, oh, your number one looks great, but in number two, there was this particular issue. Um, then in those cases, then you can feel free to then create a new submission. So don't attach your submission to a new submission comment, make a fresh new submission so that um, it'll just show up right at the top on top of your old submission so that Eric can grade just that one. And uh, then you can feel free to make those edits. Um, but I won't make any further extensions after tomorrow at 10 a.m. So um, definitely make sure to check that out. Um, and there were a lot of little problems, like even with number one, that um, I don't know if it was clear, and I tried to make this in the announcement, that the second page of the assignment, I actually give you the stock and flow diagram for number one. You just have to redraw it and then put in the formulas for there. And then on both number one and number two, whenever you put in a stock and flow diagram, you have to also tell me the formulas because otherwise a stock and flow diagram isn't that much different than a causal loop diagram. So what makes a stock and flow diagram uh, different and is that it, uh, it has those formulas as well. So make sure that you include both the stock and flow diagram and the formulas. And even if the formulas on number one, are nearly identical to formulas on number two, um, show me all the formulas you used for number two, just like you did for number one. So pretend like number two was fresh, like it didn't, um, uh, that it didn't follow on after that first problem, that it's, it's a new problem, and give me all the same formulas you used for number one, plus any new ones you added for number two. So, uh, and then for number three, which is uh, the bonus, which is a significant bonus, uh, you know, it's uh, 10 points out of 30, um, so, I mean, I think there were like 40 points possible, but it's graded out of 30. So it's like an extra 10 points. Uh, for that bonus one, I'm just asking you to do a causal loop diagram for number two. Now, I already gave you the causal loop diagram for number one on the second page of the assignment. So it's basically redrawing the causal loop diagram for number one and then modifying it for number two. And as a hint, um, you know, several people put the escalation um, archetype for number three. And as I mentioned in the comments, um, for a real toilet, the escalation archetype would be the right one there. But for the approximation we do in number two, we don't assume that the leak has any <clears throat> relationship from the toilet water level. It's just a constant out leak outflow rate. So it is a much simpler causal loop diagram in, in the number three than the escalation archetype. So if you drew an escalation archetype, you're probably thinking about the real world system. And I think that's great. But what we're looking for is you describing the approximation that was built in number two, which doesn't have that extra feedback loop. So it won't be a full escalation, even though the real world system probably would be an escalation. This is just a simplification and approximation of that, where you assume the flow rate is always constant. So um, those are the, the kind of new uh, announcements about that assignment D3. So I would definitely encourage you to take advantage of that. The other thing uh, that um, I'll mention is this respond as compliance uh, lockdown test com, uh, assignment. So um, I've adjusted the due date of that to make it more prominent so that it actually pops up on your to-do list in Canvas. But I've sent a couple of reminders about that too. Once you you do this little test assignment, which basically just uh, ensures that you can open up Respondus Lockdown Browser and answer a one question test where that one question is select the right answer. And then it says the right answer is this one. So you, um, you do that, you hit submit, and, and then that will unlock the midterm module, which will give you um, when I publish the midterm. So I'm, I've got the midterm finished and now I'm 
converting it into Canvas format. When, uh, when that then becomes unlocked, then you'll have access to it on Thursday. And we'll talk about all that in a second. But the other thing it unlocks for you that's already available are all the midterm studying resources. So I've got at least two sample midterms from previous semesters that you can access. Um, I've got a, um, a sample, just a generic sample practice midterm, uh, solutions for that, a video describing those solutions, a bunch of study res resources for the midterm are there in that module. And all you have to do to unlock that module is take the Respondus Lockdown Browser uh, compliance test, the, which is just a one question quiz that you have to take the Respondus Lockdown Browser to just show me that that's working for you technologically, and then you'll get access to those materials. So make sure that you, um, you take advantage of both of those things uh, this week and you know, preferably before the midterm. Um, the, um, and then I'll mention this here in a, sec a second um, it, because this is on the official slides too, but make sure you're thinking about those, uh, those project groups. So let me um, get into the kind of um, official slides here. And um, that, uh, and then we can start talking about the midterm and happy to take questions or happy to go through some kind of greatest hits from uh, the, the, the slides before, um, whatever you end up um, liking with that. Uh, so there's a question, um, is it okay if we have another monitor, but it's turned off? Oh, uh, if you um, do the, 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 the sweep of the room in Respondus Lockdown Browser, if there's another monitor sitting there, but it's pretty clear that it is um, unplugged, then uh, you know, so as long as you can kind of demonstrate that this other monitor you know, has the cable that is unplugged and so it's not you know, piped into anything else, then that's fine. So uh, you know, when I review these videos, uh, you know, I, I, I look for you know, other, you know, I mean, it's, it's a little bit more of an art in a science and you, you know I, I know that you know I'm not expecting you to like completely clean everything off and sanitize everything so that there's um, so that yeah I know that there's going to be some other things that are going to be on the desk and whatever and I already feel kind of bad enough to to go through this process of sort of the video proctoring um, so there's some concessions there and I'm flexible uh, likewise if you get flagged for something don't freak out. Um, you know, I know a lot of faculty, well, actually, I don't know why a lot of faculty would do this, but I know there's a bunch of faculty that don't like review the videos. And if anything gets flagged, they just immediately, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, either take points off or things like that. And, and, and so that's, that's not how I operate. So um, I, I mean, Respondus is, is um, it flags a lot of things. And so a lot of times those flags are like, you know, you just happen to put your head down for a second and that gets flagged. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll, when I review these things, I'll take care to make sure that, that anything that gets flagged that is actually a real thing. So don't, um, likewise, uh, you know, I've, uh, if, if there's, uh, you know, you happen to be taken into an area that's a common area and somebody walks through, um, you, if so they happen to say something as they're walking through, um, a lot of times people say, oh no, you know, that's been recorded, a voice and everything like that. You don't have to worry about that either if it's, if it's clear that nobody is communicating with you, like, oh, by the way, I think that answer is C, uh, then, uh, then you know, you'll, you'll be fine. So don't worry about that. The one thing that I do want to say is that occasionally um, uh, I'll, I'll get people with headphones on and, um, and they'll say why, well, you know, I had headphones on to block out noise or whatever. And, and that ends up being one of these things where I, I understand, but you have to sort of like at that point, like it, it's, that that's a harder thing for for me to allow and so it's um it's good for me to see that you are as you would present yourself if you were in the class and so preferably without earbuds in without headphones on um you know so that's something that that i do ask you to try to avoid uh, but um but otherwise um you know other little things that are going to happen are going to happen and it's not that big of a deal i will review them personally so that you don't have to worry about some automatic you know ai computer flagging them and taking points off um and um and then there's a question about the assignment d3 let's uh, i'll get to that in a moment because that might be relevant to uh just to review um but um but so let me get through these other announcements here or the other sort of and then uh we can then go on to any other questions about the exam format or exam content so um 
other reminders here. Uh, so coming up the, so, so we, as I'll, I'll mention here, um, on Thursday, we won't have any formal class. You're going to basically get 24 hours to decide when you want to start the exam. So in principle, you start the exam at three o'clock and you get 90 minutes because I allow you 15 minutes for technical issues. Um, but the exam is designed to be finished in a class period and actually likely a little bit shorter than a class period. So, um, but in order to make sure you have that class period to do it, we're not gonna have class on Thursday. So the next time um, I'll see you will be next week. So that's why I'm reminding you that there is a muddiest point um, that is gonna be due on this upcoming Sunday. And that muddiest point, you can actually reflect upon the exam. So rather than um, you know clearest, muddiest, most interesting topic from the week, you can say, what was the clearest thing from the midterm on Thursday? What was the thing that you had the most difficulty with on the midterm on Thursday? And is there anything that the midterm kind of got you um, more interested in or a connection that you hadn't thought of before that you hope will get elaborated on in the future? So that, so basically your money's point can be focused on the midterm. Um, then the midterm, um, and then so there's a question, um, and I'll go over all of this here um, in, in a second, but yes, the, the, the midterm, you, you, you can take it any time on uh, Thursday. It is, once you start it on Canvas, the clock starts ticking and you'll have 90 minutes. That can happen you know, right at midnight um, on Thursday, assuming I can get it all inputted into Canvas from my Word doc by then, but, um, but that could happen right at midnight, you know, Thursday morning, or that could happen at, you know, noon, you know, if you want to do it over lunch, or that could happen during the class period. It doesn't matter to me when you do it, but you have to do stage one alone by yourself for that 90 minutes. Um, you'll have access to a one double-sided sheet of uh, hand-produced uh, notes, um, and you'll also have access to, and I didn't put it here, but you can have a couple of blank sheets of scratch paper if you feel like that would make you more comfortable to have that scratch paper available. Um, so that you can, you know, all of Thursday, you pick the time, you find a good place that you feel comfortable taking the exam, you take it alone, um, and then you're done after that 90 minutes, and then you don't get access to it, you don't get to see the solutions, um, and that's it. But then the upcoming Tuesday, so the, the first you know, Tuesday of next week, then a second version of the exam, it'll be the exact same exam, but it'll be in, it, on Canvas, it'll be listed as a different assignment. It'll call, it'll, be say, it'll say like midterm stage two, and that one will become available and you don't need to use Respondus Lockdown Browser for that. Um, and you don't need to complete it alone. So that one, you'll get 24 hours and it's not time. It just has to be completed during that 24 hour period. So in that case, you know, it opens up uh, Tuesday morning at midnight, it closes Tuesday at 11.59 and that's all the time you have to work on it. And during that time, then, um, then uh, and there's thanks for the questions in the chat, then during that time, then you can uh, collaborate with everyone else in the class. It has to be people in the class, not people out on Chegg or Coursera or anything like that. You can use resources from Canvas. You can use the textbook. You can use your notes. Um, so um, those things are all gonna be available to you. And there's a little bit of an honor system of what you can use. So 80% of your midterm score will be this individual midterm you take on Thursday by yourself with the one sheet of notes. The other 20% of your midterm score will be the exact same exam, but together collaborative as much as you'd like, or you can take it individually, don't have to do a collaborative, but it's the exact same questions, but you'll get over the weekend to think about it. And you'll get over the weekend and you can talk to your classmates over the weekend. You can post the comments and questions on the discussion. I won't be able to give you feedback during that period, but you are definitely um, happy. You can, you can work with each other. Um, so that's basically how uh, this two-stage exam works. Um, this uh, is going to be... Uh, let me see if I've got... And I don't have any other uh, slides on this. Um, the the exam that I put together has got 25 questions formally on it and 36 points. So there's a couple of questions that have like, are like matching questions. So there'll be like five parts. So match these five things to these five things. And so that's where we get like five points for some questions. There was a, a you know, couple that are like fill in the blank. There's a couple that have drop down boxes. It's all on Canvas. 
Um, but, um, but that's basically it. It's, so I try to design it so that you could in principle uh, finish it in an hour, uh, but um, some, and with some people probably finishing it sooner than that, some people taking the whole 75 minutes, but again, I'm giving you a whole 90 minutes to account for any technical issues that might occur while you're taking it. All right, so that's a lot. Um, and there's a question, does the stage two exam open on Tuesday? That's right, the stage one exam opens on Thursday. You get 90 minutes anytime you want during Thursday to take it, then it closes, goes away. No solution set, um, no contact from me um, while uh, between stage one and stage two. Stage two opens on Tuesday. Um, and so you've had over the weekend to chat about things and you can still keep chatting with people during Tuesday and it just stays open for all of Tuesday. Um, and in that case, you can leave your submission open and you don't have to click submit. If you do click submit, I am actually gonna have it um, uh, open so that you can submit uh, multiple times so that uh, if you do happen to submit it and then you talk to one of your classmates and then, oh, oh shoot, for number four, I really should have done this then you can go back and um, you'll, you won't be able to edit the previous submission, but you'll be able to submit a new one. And then, um, and then that the highest grade will be the one that it uses. And you can do that as much as you want, but it ends at the end of Tuesday and there will be no formal class on Tuesday. So again, um, I want to give you as much time as you, uh, you need for these two stages. So no class on Thursday, no class on Tuesday. That way, if you only have the class period to really work on the exam, then you'll have the class period on Thursday to work on stage one and the class period on Tuesday to work on stage two. But everybody can take the whole 24 hours as they like. You can come back to it as much as you want on that Tuesday stage two. Are there other questions about this, this format? This is a format I started experimenting with last semester and uh, got generally good feedback from students in a couple of different classes. And so that's why I'm continuing to, to work with this format. Um, on Tuesday, could we join the class Zoom to work with other students? Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, the, the only caution, maybe what uh, we, oh, so the, the only caution with that is if I happen to get a, another Zoom call that I have to take that's during the class period, if I join that, um, and in fact, I'm not even sure if I'm, because, because the Zoom room is hosted by me, I'm a little worried that if I um, even join another Zoom call that happens to be during that period, it's gonna kick anybody else off. So, um, so if somebody else could wanted to create their own Zoom room for Tuesday and is willing to offer that up, that's fine with me. Or, um, you know, you also have access to Microsoft Teams, I think as part of your Office 365 with ASU, that's fine. If Eric's willing to, um, to be there during class on Tuesday, then if, if those of you on campus want to meet in the classroom, that's fine with me as well. Um, so maybe we can make that a to-do item is that, um, that somebody hopefully can come up with a Zoom room that they're willing to, unfortunately I have meetings, um, you know, pretty much all day um, on every day. And so it's hard for me to offer up a Zoom room that could be available for anybody to come into like a study hall. All right, great. Any other questions about the format? All right. So um, the rest of what I have today is um, this, and I'll leave this up here too, if there's questions that you'd like to post on the um, meeting pulse, then, um, and I guess I might also point out where, so I'm gonna bring this over to, I've got my student view here, just to point out where everything is. So if you were to go on to Canvas and you were to go over to modules here, um, then we've got the course information module and everything. Um, if you, I'm just gonna collapse all of these here. If you scroll down past all of the assignment modules, you get to the unit modules. 
which I'm hoping some of you have taken a look at because we basically just reorganized the assignments and lectures and things within the units. And if you go past unit D, then there, there you find the two midterm modules. And this, this first one is the one that houses this compliance test. That is that one question test you have to take through Respondus Lockdown Browser. But once you take it, then you'll get access to this midterm unit. And my student uh, here, um, this test student hasn't taken it. That's why these are all grayed out. But once you have tested it, these will ungray. And the lecture slides that I have here are there. There's a midterm practice problem set, a solution set to it, a video explanation of the solution set, two prior sample midterms, one from 2019, the other from 2020. Um, I think at least one of these was done via Scantron. So it'll be a there's kind of a similar format as the, um, the Canvas one. Of course, Canvas is not quite Scantron, but it's closer than like free answer. Um, and then down here, they're not released yet, but the actual exams that you'll take will be under here, under exams. That you'll, you'll see the midterm stage one, and then on Tuesday, you'll see the midterm stage two, and you'll end up finding them there. Uh, there's a question, are the Moorcraft reading chapter quizzes <clears throat> answers available? Um, I I'll have to go back and look. Um, it's my impression that the answer should be available for you, but I'll have to double check to see if they are. But I think I have a check that um, the exercise answers are definitely available. The assessments are probably not available, um, but the assessments answers are sort of, sort of been weaved into the slides that correspond to those assessments. But the exercises, the answers are definitely available on, on Canvas. All right, so any other questions about uh, format and material availability, where to find things? Um, the other thing I might um, point out here is that in the midterm module, there's this little study guides for units A through D. And if you click on that, it basically is a page that has <clears throat> all of these, these study guides <clears throat> for each of the four units. And um, those are each at the top of each one of the units. And they just summarize what we did in that, um, in that unit and then list the learning outcomes. And the learning outcomes are the things that you should know coming out of the unit. So those are the things you should sort of study. Like, do you understand, you know, can you define a model, et cetera. And so throughout this presentation, um, I basically have gone through each unit and have listed these learning outcomes and then picked out kind of the slides that I thought are kind of the most salient slides from that unit. I'm happy to go through those, but I'm also happy to take just your own, your questions. Um, and then if we end up um, you know, needing to kill time, I'll go back to the slides I prepared. But so there's already one question about number two on assignment D3. Are there any other um, questions? We'll go ahead and think about those questions. And then let me take that question on number two on uh, assignment D3. So um, what was that question on assignment D3? I think uh, it was Morgan maybe who had that yeah. question, if I remember. Go Sorry. ahead. So I think it was like a more of a technical problem that I was going into. So um, you had said like in Vincent, Vincent that we don't need to put the integral um, or the initial, but we only need the initial value for water level. Um, but for right. some reason, when I leave it blank um, and I hit okay, it'll say unable to understand the right hand side of this equation. Right. So you, you don't, so you don't um, basically um, Vincent should automatically the part that says um, integ, and I'm putting this sort of in the chat. Um, so in that dialog box, that equation dialog box um, for a stock, uh, and while I talk, I'll see if I can bring up Vincent. Um, so in, okay, good, it popped up quick. So let me just bring this up here so I can show this and I'll get rid of this. So if I were to bring up a level or a stock, like water level like this one. And then let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, if I were to go to equations and, or maybe I'll just link a rate to it just to demonstrate here. So rate, I'll call this inflow. And I'll also do a rate that goes out. I'll call it outflow. And if I were to go to equations and click on the stock here, 
then automatically it should populate this integ here with all of the inflows added up together minus all of the outflows added up together. And you just leave this alone. You don't delete it. Um, you, you don't, you, but you just let VinSim take care of this for you. If you've gone and edited this, then it's possible VinSim will stop maintaining it for you. In which case, if you wanted to manually do this, it, the, for, the right formula here is just whatever variable name you called your inflow minus whatever variable you named you called your outflow. That's what's supposed to be up here. But that should be done for you. And if you keep your hands off of it, then all you have to adjust is this initial value down here, which for the toilet tank is going to be zero because it starts at zero. For other problems, it might be something else. Okay, so, so the, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But um, just for reference, it said in the comments that you had for me, it said for water level, you do not need to list the formula that goes inside the integ part on the on Vensum and only give me the initial condition. And so I thought you meant to like completely delete the integ because I already had those variables like in there. And so that was just confusing of what I was trying to like, I was trying to like understand right. by the comment on the. Homework. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry for that confusion. So when I left the, that comment on, on people's, it's because the, some people listed um, both the the um this expression up here as well as the initial value and that might have been what happened in your case and um and and so it can be a little confusing to list to say like um you know if you said water level equals inflow minus outflow that's technically not like the right equation because technically water level is the integral of this inflow minus outflow and all of that so um, rather than reporting the in this at all, like I was saying, leave it alone in Vincent, but then when you report it to me in the Word doc, I only need to see the initial value. Oh, By seeing yeah. the diagram, it implies um, all that I need to know about this formula. Gotcha. That makes sense now. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. Sorry for the confusion. No, no, it's all good. Thanks. All right, are there um, other questions that I can handle or would you like me to just um, start marching through this review and then as you have questions, just bark them at me and I can stop. Is there any right. way that you could go through um, like, what's it called? The reinforcing and balancing loops and how, um, and just like kind of go through like the how to determine if it's a positive or negative link on that variable. Sure. Yeah, and, and because a couple of people would say march through, then um, that's actually going to come up here. And I'm looking at my little slide previews um, in just a couple of slides. So let me just start marching through, and then I think we'll hit exactly that. Okay. Sorry, no worries. Right. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little too quick this morning, so appreciate it. Uh, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, okay, so yeah, if we go all the way back to unit A, um, I know it seems kind of philosophical, but um, for me, um, you know, these are like really important things like like unit A um, sort of stuff. For those of you that watched uh, the video that was released from the, the Mars rover landing, um, then, um, then they um, most, then they, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that they talked about was that for the first time ever, they've seen a video of plume effects as this lander was landing on the Martian soil. And they could see, um, you know, these sheets that were being created as these plumes hit the ground. And they had thought about what this might look like. And they had sort of built mathematical models that guessed what this was like, but they never could verify them. And now that they had the video, then this video they said is going to help them enhance the way they think about these plumes so that moving forward as they land larger things and eventually manned uh, uh, you know, missions to Mars, then they'll have a much better idea of how these plumes work. And so that was an idea, that this idea that even a video can be a model because that video provides insights into the what if question of what if you had this, these four, uh, you know, rockets that are coming down, you know, generating these plumes, um, then what would happen with the debris patterns and things like that. And so the video itself is going to become a model that they use that's even stronger than their mathematical models that they had built beforehand. 
So, um, so that's why I sort of beat you over the head with like, you know, being able to define a model, um, identify the different types of models, gain awareness of your mental models and the constant way you're updating your mental models. So, so those are the things I want you to make sure you can hit there. So when you think back at unit A, we talked about a wide variety of models. And now I brought up a video model, you know, a video of, uh, you know, from seeing a, 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 a spacecraft land on another planet, you know, that becomes a model for future uh, spacecraft design. And, um, and so models answer what if questions. So that'll be the big definition that I'd always be looking for. So the big thing here is that models are not defined by what is inside them or what they're made of, but how they are used. They are defined by this task of answering what if questions. And so hopefully when you look at all of these, you can sort of see that in fashion models and models of the atom, in um, animal models used in say pharmaceutical trials, um, in models of population dynamics and so on and so forth. Um, now, uh, you know, I, I, you know, hopefully we've uh, made clear the difference between qualitative mental models and quantitative models. Mental models um, are the things that help us get through the day. Um, they uh, make use of a tremendous store of information. Um, I drive an electric vehicle that when it is in um, uh, a, uh, a drive through uh, for a Starbucks on Broadway, there happens to be a picture from the restaurant next over that has a person on a pier walking out on that pier, and it always thinks that's the real person. And my mental model tells me that that picture of a person is not a real person because of all the context. The car doesn't have that um, a tremendous store of information that allows it to tell the difference between a picture of a person and a real person. And so that's why my mental model beats the car. But um, the car is much better at handling dynamic complexity and change. The same car that I drive, but not my car, but the same model, um, uh, you know, was, there's been videos of uh, people colliding with these cars um, uh, it, from behind due to an accident caused by a human driver. And the car, while it's on autopilot, um, is able to um, deflect that and just keep on driving. Whereas maybe a human driver, if you got rear-ended, um, you know, then that might, uh, you might not be able to react quickly enough and you might yourself go into, um, you know, tailspins and other things like that, which the, the car is able to very quickly react and, um, and compensate for that. So it just goes to show that, you know, the difference between our, our mental models and our, like there's, they're not, one's not better and the others isn't worse, but they're good for different things. So understand the strengths and weaknesses of mental models and, um, and then the strengths and weaknesses of those quantitative models. And we mentioned that there's different types of quantitative models. There can be the, the math that we can solve and, um, and that uh, can be great for some things, but in reality, this is not really great to communicate to others with. And in the end, the types of things that we can solve with the tools that we have are often very limited. And so we have simulation models, which is what we've been learning how to do. And those simulation models um, end up allowing us to do a lot of things that would just not be very easy to handle in the mathematics. We lose the ability to generate equations that give us this like nice concise way to summarize what we've learned. But we get these graphs out that um, end up uh, allowing us to sort of build hypothetical universes that, um, that allow us to kind of play in in these different sandboxes in ways in which we can't do in the real world and we um, can't um, you know, kind of do is completely in the mathematical world. So that's kind of what we do with our simulation methods. So um, the other sort of philosophical thing I want to make sure that you got, you've got uh, some comfort with is this spectrum, this idea of the, um, that models always fit somewhere on the spectrum. If you take two models, you can always put them relative to each other on this spectrum. So we've talked about causal loop diagrams are more metaphorical, stock and flow diagrams, they have more, um, uh, they have more realistic detail, so they're more analog. The more metaphorical get you get, the more generalizable. Sort of the 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 wider um, the the bigger the umbrella gets on the type of phenomenon you carry, but it becomes less specialized to any particular context. When you really need specialized uh, models to understand, you know, a specific organism, a specific city, etc., then you have to push it more to the left 
and start building analog models. So Mars, that video of the lander landing on Mars, that is a very specific model for when we wanna land on Mars. Now this video is a much better model of how we can land on Mars. The mathematical models they were using before they had that video were more generalizable. It was like, how do we land on any planet um, if we kind of like maybe use parameters we think are out there on Mars. Basically, it wasn't anything special to Mars except for maybe fitting the right parameters. They might find that from the video that you need a totally special model for Mars that doesn't really fit what we think about the generic land on a planet model. So the land on a planet model is kind of the more monopoly metaphorical, whereas the video of landing on Mars is more the analog. All right, so we ideally get in sort of middle. So are there any questions there about the kind of philosophical, what is a model and how does this modeling spectrum work? Does that make sense? Okay, great. So unit B is more the question that was brought up. Um, oh yeah, so there was a question, uh, can I repeat what CLDs fit into? So um, so I would say that um, it's, not that it's not that models fit into one particular way, but if I take two types of models, then I can put them next to each other on the spectrum in a particular order. So if I were to take, um, let's see if I do um, uh, pen here. So if I were to say, where do CLDs fit? Uh, versus stock and flow diagrams, so I'll just call it SFD, then I would say this is probably the ordering is that the CLDs are more metaphorical and generalizable where the stock and flow diagrams um, have more realistic scaling. So we add more realism. So we say, you know, there are a wide range of S-shaped growth curves. And so it could be, um, you know, climate change is an S-shaped growth curve, but so are fishery dynamics. Um, but uh, if I actually want to model the time scale of fisheries, well, that's very different than climate change. So when I specialize it to fisheries, then I end up needing to put the real dynamics in for how quickly fish reproduce. And that requires me to use uh, stock and flow diagrams, which capture all the causal links of causal loop diagrams plus more of the realistic detail. Now, studying fisheries probably doesn't help me study climate change. So by it's almost like I've committed to studying fisheries. Now, this stock and flow diagram is metaphorical enough that it gives me generalizable insight across a wide range of fisheries. Now, once I do talk about a harvested fishery, then I maybe need a more detailed stock and flow model. And so I keep moving farther to the left as I drill down into the particular context. Um, so there's a question, so would it be like a, uh, the funnel cloud? Yeah, so a funnel cloud, um, the, the idea of a, a picture of a funnel cloud or the word funnel cloud, that would be, um, I would say that's generalizable. It kind of fits sort of over here, whereas a actual mathematical computational model of how a tornado forms over a particular body of water would be more analog, which would be kind of over here. So the funnel cloud is not quite plausible scaling yet because a funnel cloud, you haven't really sort of said like how big the funnel is and how small, there's like a lot of different types of funnels. We just say it looks roughly like a funnel. So that's why I'd say a funnel cloud is over here. Whereas a, an actual like model of a tornado forming um, in all of the dynamical detail is more over here. And that might, you might, that might be different depending on what hemisphere of the earth you're on, for example. <clears throat> All right, so any other questions about this kind of philosophical stuff? All right, so let's get to the, um, the, the you know, unit B where we introduce CLDs. So this is sort of the stuff, this is the kind of, you know, these are the things when you study, make sure you can do these four things here. Um, and, um, and so these ones are generic things about CLDs. And this is like, make sure that if I, um, you know, showed you something drawn in VinSim or Insight Maker, that um, it would, um, it, that, you know, that would, or make sure you at least kind of know how you would use a software program to draw a CLD. So CLDs for us, that's this thing that fits um, in the middle here where it captures the feedback loops 
um, whereas it also you know, captures all the variables, but it leaves out all the dynamics. So we said that when we are thinking about the design of these computational models, you either can think from the feedback loops and then you add detail to build them into the CLDs and you add even more detail to build them um, into the stock and flow diagrams, or you can go the other way around. And so sometimes um, it, you'll, um, a mathematician or maybe um, even a physiologist or somebody like that, they're gonna know about the detailed dynamical processes and you'll be able to fit them into these models and you'll build this big ugly stock and flow diagram. And then you have to ask like, but what's really going on here? Well, then you can start from the stock and flow diagram and look for these feedbacks and once you, then you can describe these feedbacks with less detail and it makes it easier to see these feedbacks. And then you can maybe pop off some of the variables and just get the feedback loops. And then that sort of um, maybe gives you a lot better perspective on what's going on in the detailed model. You can go both ways. Um, in the class, we sort of have gone this direction. Um, we just buy because it's, you know, that's the direction that I decided to teach these things in. But I could have also gone the other direction, started with the calculus and the stock and flow diagrams, and then gone the analysis direction where we then build up feedback loops. So, um, but he, so in practice, we do both. So now getting to the question of choosing um, the dimensions and or choosing the directions and then finding the feedback loops and things. So, the um, if I give you, you know, if you imagine you have three variables here, then um, then this you have to when you choose these polarities, what you're trying to say is how does the thing on the other end of the arrow affect the thing at the head of the arrow relative to kind of a no change baseline. So the idea here is if um, my baseline is I leave A, B, and C alone. And then I imagine a hypothetical world where I somehow only increased B. And in that hypothetical world where only B increases, then I see does X increase or decrease relative to that baseline case where everything was set alone. And if I find that X does the opposite thing, then I label this with a minus or an O. So that's where we get this here. Now, um, I could write this in a formula. Like I could have said something like, um, you know, X equals A minus um, B. Um, and then maybe I take this whole thing and then I multiply it um, by C. Um, well, maybe I don't want to get that complicated here. Let me do a, a simpler thing. So what if I did X um, equals, and let me just make it a little bit more generic here. So instead of A minus, I'm going to do um, A divided by B. And then I'll say minus C. Um, and I'll, yeah, I'll get to the question here in a second. So, um, so if I were to give you a formula like this, and I could maybe say, um, if A, B, and C are independent variables, and X is the dependent variable here. So um, X is sort of, you know, changes in A, B, or C cause changes in X. Then um, how do we draw a stock and flow diagram that corresponds to this? Well, I have to imagine that if I increase A, but leave everything else the same, Oh, well, that creates an increase in X. If I increase B and leave everything else the same, well, because there's a division here, then increasing B shrinks this term over here, this A divided by B term. So that's gonna cause a decrease in X. So in that case, that's why we get a minus here. Then if I need to say, well, well then what do I put over here? Well, then I have to look at this expression here and I say, well, if I increase C, that's gonna subtract more from the, pre the, from the kind of baseline case. So the baseline case was C was the value it was. And then if I increase C, well, that's gonna subtract more from that kind of baseline. And so that's gonna have a decrease on X. And so that would suggest that maybe I should do a minus here or label this with opposite and I could label this one with same. That would be the alternative way to label these things. 
And so, um, so that's kind of the big thing about labeling these things here. Even if there is a relationship between B and C, I have to ignore that. And I have to focus just on the relationships with X. So if, if even in real life, there's no way to increase B without increasing C as well, I have to sort of imagine, hypothetically speaking, because I'm only focusing on X, I have to sort of say, if B were to increase, imagine that C stayed the same, then what would happen to X? and so on. So are there questions about this slide here, about choosing the minuses and pluses and going from an expression like this one to, um, to an, uh, a causal loop diagram like this one? Does that make sense? Um, so I had a question. Um, so like just for example, if X was I don't know, like climate change and then B was greenhouse gases or something like, or something that decreases pollution with whatever it is. Like, I think you were saying earlier, you have to find out if B increases, then what's the effect of C? And I was curious if you can also, if you like have to look at it that way, or if you can look at it like, if B has a decrease, what is the effect of C? Because that would be a different relationship. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I don't I don't think I quite understand what you're saying uh, right now. I, I mean, if you're saying, can you do increases or decreases? You don't have to do increase. You could also do decrease and okay, that works too. Yeah, that's basically what I was asking. Right, and, and that's why this same and opposite sometimes are easier to think about than the plus and minus, even though they mean the, the same things. Mm -hmm. So um, so yeah, you can, if it's easier for you to think about, you can say, well, if I decreased B, what would be the effect on X? And in this case, if I decreased B, I get an increase in X. And because those are opposite changes, then I would label this um, as it is already labeled with a minus okay. or with an opposite. That actually does help a lot. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions with this? All right, so when you do all these things, then we build up loops um, sometimes. So, and this is another thing, a causal loop diagram does not have to have a loop. CLDs are used to find loops. They do not need to have loops. So that's kind of a good sort of true false thing to keep in mind, that CLDs don't need to have loops, they're used to find loops. That's why they're called causal loop diagrams. Um, they just need to represent causal links. Now, when you start drawing those causal links, sometimes you do find that loops come up. And so then the question is, how do we label these loops into negative feedback and positive feedback? And you just count the number of negatives as you go around every loop. And so um, in like this particular case, there's one negative. And so that gave made this a negative uh, loop here. So this here is going to be a negative or a balancing feedback loop. So I could also label that with balancing. Now, if there were two negatives or no negatives or four negatives, if there's an even number of negatives, then it's a positive feedback loop, um, otherwise known as a reinforcing feedback loop. So that would be another way that you could label that. Okay. Um, so are there questions about this idea of counting the number of links around a loop? Um, what was an example of a reinforcing and a balancing situation? Can you just, from our classes previously, could you just remind me possibly, please? Uh, a reinforcing and a, did you say a reinforcing and a balancing? Yeah, like yeah, for like both? situations from what we've kind of, oh, look, you're already doing that. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Right, so so um, there's some great examples in the chat here that are popping up. Um, so like population, um, so that's a, a so you know on the positive side of things. So you know it's basically behavior over times that look like this, and population growth is a great one. So um, so population growth, at least initially. Uh, but when there's no limitation seems to grow exponentially, and so that's a good one for reinforcing or positive feedback. Uh, balancing would be like, um, yeah, bacteria. That would be a, a good a bacteria until they run out of medium or run out of space. Then they start getting limited by that. Um, so, but like a toilet tank example is on the balancing side or the negative feedback side or the counteracting side of things. So in that case, 
um, it's really about the deficit of water in the tank. And that deficit is always coming to zero. So really there, the limitation, the target is what's driving all of the dynamics. In growth, there's not a target that's driving it. It's the fact that the things that you have there are building more of those things. And so it's creating more and more, and it, it appears to be unlimited until you start modeling the limitations in. That's what makes it reinforcing or positive. In the toilet tank example, even though the water level is rising, we don't view it as a growth process because the process is actually being driven by a deficit in the tank that is constantly declining to zero. So if I were to model the deficit in the toilet tank, it starts at 15 and then it goes down to zero. And that is um, just, that's the flow. If you were to plot the flow instead of the water level, then that would look like that. So that's what's going on there. So in a balancing loop, there's going to be at least one variable that if you were to plot is going to look like this one over here. In a um, reinforcing loop, um, if you plot variables, um, there's going to be all of them are either going to look like this or they're going to look like the negative version of that, where it's plummeting down to negative infinity. So you're going to climb to positive infinity or, or, or plummet to negative infinity. Um, so are there are questions about that. Okay. So uh, being able to label these loops, hopefully we feel kind of comfortable about this. Um, so this is just an exercise we did in class where we found a loop here, we found uh, a loop um, around here, and then we also found a loop around the whole outside. And so um, I would normally label it actually in here, even though this is not the loop here. So the real loop is around the whole outside of this, but um, we would typically label it here and then systems thinkers are trained this way would know that the loop that we labeled here is not referring to this thing because this thing in the middle is not a loop. It's referring to this larger loop over here. So there's three loops here. And if I go through here, I can see this one's a negative feedback loop. I can see this one over here is a negative feedback loop. And across um, all of this, there's two negatives. And so this is a positive feedback loop. And, um, and there's a question about S-shaped growth. In S-shaped growth, that's a combination of two loops where one of them is reinforcing and the other one is balancing. And so when the state variables, when the stocks in an S-shaped growth are low, then it's primarily going to have growth. But as that growth gets larger, then that stock is going to kick in the, the, the balancing loop, and then that is going to create a limitation that will cause it to round off. So it's kind of like bacteria plus toilet tank, is that the bacteria grows until it gets to a point where there's like a carrying capacity, and that carrying capacity ends up acting like the water level in the toilet tank, and that's what causes it to round off in a different shape. Okay, so questions about this one. Is it clear how we found three loops? And we can label the three loops. All right, there are questions. Why are the loops on the sides balancing? Um, that's a great question. So the loops here, like this loop is this arrow, this arrow, and this arrow. And if I look there, there's a positive, negative, and a positive. So if I were to count the number of links, then I only have one negative link. And that one negative link is an odd number of negative links. And so if it's odd ne uh, negative links, so odd number of negative, odd number negative, um, uh, corresponds to a balancing loop. And so that's why both of the loops on the two outsides are balancing. If there's an even number of negatives, it's reinforcing. And so that's why this negative and this negative make it so that around the whole outside, there are two. So it's an even number, and that's why they're positive. And the whole outside is positive, and that's because there's two negatives. There's an even number here. So an even number of negatives makes the whole big loop positive even though the outer two loops um, are negative. So Alexander, did that answer your question or does, um, does that make sense?
And so over here, just, uh, you know, again, this has got three links and one of the three links is negative. Okay. All right, any other questions about this? All right, um, other things, um, you know, just, you know, make sure you, you sort of practice finding errors and things. And so, you know, we, um, we mentioned that uh, here, this here is the wrong loop label. And that's because there is one negative link in this loop. Don't be distracted by this guy out here. This one out here is, um, it's an important causal link for the system, but in terms of the feedback, it is not playing a role in the feedback. There are only three links in the feedback loop and only one is negative. And so this should be a negative feedback loop, not a positive feedback loop. Over here, this looks like a loop because it's drawn as an oval, but there's no actual loop because everything points to D. So D has no causal influ influence on anything else. It's basically an output of the system. And so this shouldn't even be there. So this is an example of a CLD with no loops. Even though it looks like a loop, it doesn't actually have a loop. Okay. It's still a CLD. So both of these are CLDs. So it's still a CLD, but it's not a, um, uh, it doesn't have any feedback loops. So this is an example where somebody describes to you A, B, C, and D and how they relate to each other. And you diagram it all out and you say, oh, you know, the process you described to me in pieces when I put it together as a system has no feedback. And so we don't need to worry about the problems or opportunities that correspond to having feedbacks because everything is basically just a downstream. So basically in this system, if you knew C, you would implicitly know B and D and you don't need to worry about all the crazy feedbacks. They just sort of fall directly out of knowing C. Um, so knowing C and A is sort of enough. Um, we don't need a, a balancing loop for there to be feedback. It could be either um, a uh, balancing loop or a reinforcing loop for there to be feed feedback. Just means that if I start with a variable, like over here, if I start with B and I follow the links around, eventually there is a path that leads back to B. Over here, if I start with any one of these variables, there is never a path that leads back to the variable. It gets stuck. So if I start with C, I get stuck at D. I can't move against the arrow. If I start at B, I get stuck at D. If I start at A, I get stuck at D. So you just keep getting stuck at D. There's no path back, and so there's no loops. There's no feedback. Okay. Any other questions about that? All right, if there are other questions, you know, just keep throwing them out. Um, and I'm also just gonna quickly take a look at the website to make sure that there's no questions submitted there. All right, doesn't look like it, good. Okay, so um, also causation and correlation. This is sort of an important one, um, you know, that makes sure that um, just because they're, the two things are correlated, doesn't mean you should draw a causal link between them. It may be the case that sunburn rate and ice cream sales always increase or decrease together. And it's tempted, tempting to say that one might have a same relationship with the other one, but that's incorrect. In reality, it's probably that they're both influenced by a variable that we haven't written out. And so in this case, there is a, an average temperature that when it increases, sunburn rate increases. When it increases, ice cream sales increase. So this is one variable average temperature that has a causal link to two other things. And because it's a common cause, it creates a correlation between these variables, but I do not draw a link between them because links have to be causal. They have to not just be, they happen to be doing the same thing. It has to be that the change in the thing that is on the tail end of the arrow or the tail end of the link is actually causing a change on the head side of the link. So, are there questions about that? I think usually what I get questions on is more this next slide, which is um, how do I name these things? 
And so um, this is where um, you need to sort of, you know, hopefully now that we've started to model things uh, in stock and flow, this is making a little bit more sense, uh, you know, but uh, the idea here is you can't put verbs um, in these things. They have to be noun phrases. And so um, I can't create a stock called costs rise because, you know, how does costs rise? How is that something that accumulates over time? Costs, however, could be um, something that's measurable and price could be something that is measurable um, and a, a noun quantity. So that's why we've got costs and price over here. So as costs rise, so do prices. So that's why this is written there. Um, the other thing is you want a clear sense of direction. And so, uh, you know, the feedback from boss, it's not clear that that's good feedback or bad feedback. So, um, you know, the, if just, you know, knowing that you got feedback doesn't generally make someone happy. And then knowing, you know, and, and this doesn't tell me what type, you know, I, it's unclear to me if your mental attitude increases if that means you become more aggressive like you have more of an attitude or more positive so if i were to instead be more specific then i can say that praise ends up increasing morale morale is something that if you increase morale we know exactly what that means we, we don't have to be more specific in, in um, praise from boss it's clear that, that is a good feedback i could say if i decrease my praise from boss it will decrease my morale. Now, because they both moved in the same direction, it's still a positive link here. And then um, the normal sense of direction should hopefully be positive. And so um, it is, you know, rather than saying we have costs and losses, um, you know, rather than saying losses here, it's, we're saying, well, the losses are kind of a negative measurement when we could just as easily measure the opposite of losses, which are profits. And so negative profits are losses, just like negative losses are profits. But why say negative losses like that? That's a double negative. So we don't want to set ourselves up for double negatives. We would much rather create a variable name that is by default positive. And that's why we have profits here. So we can then put the negative into the arrow. So that's kind of the idea is you want the modifier to be in the arrows polarity and not in the name itself. So are there any questions about these rules? About good and bad rules for these names? Okay. And then more rules for that. This is sort of just, again, summarizing what I was just kind of demonstrating. All right. So um, you know now we're sort of moving into you know how do you um, how do you draw these things and so I gave some examples back in class about well this is effectively the toilet tank here so this is like the toilet tank water level this is like the flow of water that is being controlled by the valve um, in the toilet tank but here. Um, whereas the toilet tank, they've created a mechanism that monitors the water level and adjusts the valve accordingly. Here, we're suggesting that it's a human that is the mechanism that does it, but otherwise it's the same process. So, um, so be kind of comfortable with this idea that you can uh, put a flow variable in here and then in this negative feedback loop, it will end up being a negative feedback loop and you'll have your level variable And, uh, and I see the hand being raised here. I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. And, um, and then in the toilet tank example, we also had a target water level. So we had a target that was coming up here. And this is your standard kind of negative feedback loop where you may or may not have a target, but, uh, but if uh, you have a target, then increasing the target is one way that causes an increase in flow. Regardless of how the flow increases, if the flow increases, it will create an increase in the level. And as the level increases, that will uh, decrease the flow. So because this loop is a feedback loop, has one negative, an odd number of negatives, then this is a balancing or a negative feedback loop. So I'll say balancing or negative. So any questions about going from this description 
to the CLD, going from the stock and flow effectively here to the CLD? Um, I'm actually going to answer it, uh, ask it anyway. Um, so for the target part, um, would that be constituted as like the hand and eye coordination? Because that's where you're like moving or adjusting the amount of like, you know what I'm saying? Well, the, the, the target, it's kind of like um, filling up. So sometimes the target could be in your head. It's like if you were filling up a measuring cup with water, um, you might need a cup of water. Well, so um, the knowledge of that you need a cup is in your head, but the actual target is a dash that's on the measuring cup. And so the eye is comparing where the water level is to where it should be. And it's using that to know how to adjust the sink. And so, um, you know, we're, we're sort of assuming that what sets the target water level is exogenous to the system. So it's almost as if in your measuring cup, you forget that anything else exists except for the, the one cup mark. Okay. And that target water level just becomes kind of a part of the system. Right, okay, all right, that makes sense, thanks. Uh-huh. All right, any other questions about this one? So, you know, just get used to sort of, um, uh, you know, labeling links, um, uh, you know, coming up with the, you know, so in this case, you know, these were um, all positive links around here, making a positive feedback loop. Um, this one here, there was a negative link here and a negative link here, but otherwise the rest of these were all positive, making for a positive feedback loop. Um, there were uh, positive links out here that were outside of this. They do not participate in the loop, um, but that was sort of the, um, the, the answer to that particular assignment that we were doing. Um, and then we sort of learned uh, later, this is kind of the success to the successful archetype. Um, so, uh, but you know, the, the, the exercise here was getting used to labeling links and finding loops and then labeling loops. So any questions about any of that? Do we feel good about labeling links and loops? Okay. So then we moved into unit C and that's where we really got started to get into true systems thinking and, um, and the ability to use system archetypes to think um, systematically about larger combinations of feedback loops that pop up in these CLDs. And so this um, idea that we were kind of railing against the event-oriented worldview, so try to understand the contrast between the event-oriented worldview and feedback systems thinking. Um, this idea in feedback systems thinking that you not only consider the problem and a potential solution, but also potential side effects of that solution that themselves create feedbacks back onto the problem. So that's the idea of feedback systems thinking. Um, and uh, when we consider these combinations of loops and how they interact, then it allows us to come up with sort of a dictionary of known behaviors over time. And so this idea of a simple balancing feedback loop with a delay depending on how big that delay is, can generate um, uh, deviations from what we would expect from a balancing feedback loop. So ideally we would like the water level in the tank to rise directly up, uh, but um, you know, we might um, expect that we're not gonna hit that and so it's gonna be much slower, but in reality, we might, in the case of temperature in a shower, for example, get oscillations. Um, if, um, again, going back to the Mars example, if you watch the video that they released, they said at one point in the video, they did a divert maneuver where you actually watch them with this uh, vehicle driving it far, as it's descending, they caused it to uh, overshoot its target and come back. And that um, overshoot was programmed in to the vehicle to deal with uh, preventing swinging of the vehicle. So um, sometimes you might see real cranes um, on earth doing a similar sort of a maneuver where they overshoot a target, which allows them to slow down at a rate, which allows them to then land on their target without the thing, the crane swinging. And that's exactly what they did when they landed that thing on Mars. 
So um, there's a question here. So this was like uh, finding a short-term solution instead of a long-term one. That's an example of yeah, systems thinking um, is recognizing that short-term solutions um, sometimes correct fix the symptoms of problems without actually fixing the fundamental problem. And that there are fundamental solutions that say in the example of the shifting the burden archetype, uh, then that is an example of where a, a short-term solution seems like it makes an effect, but in reality, it reduces the effectiveness of the long-term solution that should probably be pursued instead. So, um, so that's an example of systems thinking. So we went through, I'm not gonna have you memorize all of those long, you know, that long list of systems archetypes from Kim and Lannan. I will tell you that I'm actually gonna provide that to you, that list of systems, basically the cheat sheet um, that, uh, you know, if you, if you open up Kim and Lannan, that applying system archetypes paper, there was a sheet where they list um, like, I don't know, eight different common archetypes and they give kind of a little pattern of the loops and then a little paragraph blurb on describing what they are. I will give you that, that'll be a part of the exam. So you don't need to write that down or memorize that, but be able to sort of look through and differentiate um, among all of those, like what's the difference between those. And knowing these basic archetypes from Moorcroft are good ones. So this idea of knowing that a, uh, you know, a balancing loop with delay generates this type of behavior. Knowing that, um, you know, so that and this oscillation, that's what generates this balancing with delay. That's kind of what I was trying to say there. And that a, you know, this, if you need a mental model for that, then think about, you know, regulating the temperature in a shower where the shower water is, takes a very long time to respond to how quickly you turn the knob. Um, then, you know, S-shaped growth, that's one that, um, oh, my uh, PowerPoint failed here. Um, so I'll bring that back up. S-shaped growth is another one that you should um, be familiar with because it's just so common. And so that was the one we talked about a couple of times now. Um, this, uh, yeah, thanks, that the, that the balancing loop um, is, uh, will end up squashing the uh, the, the balancing loop will end up being, uh, squashing the reinforcing loop that makes the growth curve uh, uh, work. And so over here in S-shaped growth, that's basically what, uh, what we're talking about here, a, a reinforcing loop that gets killed as the state variable gets larger by a balancing loop. And you know nothing grows to the sky, so you always got that. And then you can combine all of that together by adding a delay in one of these loops, usually say the, the limiting loop, and then that delay gives you growth with limitation, but you can get overshoot. And so in the limits to global growth model from Forrester, that's what generated this major collapse in the human population was one of these overshoots where they went way over carrying capacity and then carrying capacity yanked them back down and that greatly reduced uh, the human population in his hypothetical scenario. Okay. So, um, the, I guess the, um, you know, sort of jumping ahead here, um, I'm not gonna go over all of the, the Kim and Lannan stuff, but I do, um, uh, you know, wanna make sure that you sort of understand that there are these four different basic ways to make use of these systems archetypes. And I think it's important to kind of go through and sort of uh, make sure you kind of understand the philosophical reason or uh, uses, I guess, of these, of, of using a system archetype as a lens or a structural pattern template or a tool for predicting behavior or a dynamic theory. And, you know, the examples that were used in that document. And I've put some um, auxiliary documents back in unit C that give even more examples of that if you need kind of additional help or examples for that. So it's 414, so I'm gonna to skip to the end of unit C and, um, and maybe I just wanna open it up for any final questions here. I do have office hours today because I couldn't hold them yesterday and I'll have them um, after class. Um, so I think I'll technically start them at 430, but I can stick around here for a few questions as well. So let me do this for um, before anybody asks questions. Let me just give um, everybody this attendance question. And so the link is in the chat. And uh, the question I'll give you um, is um, how many negative or give given, yeah, well, I guess, yeah, 
give a number of negative links that would correspond to a, a positive feedback loop. And, um, and then if, if you have specific questions about unit D, I'm happy to take them either now hanging out after class here or during office hours, but I don't, I'm not gonna have a formal lecture in office hours, but I'm happy to go over slides for unit D. Um, hopefully it's still fresh in everybody's mind that you know, questions would be there. And then, yeah, if you're um, if you don't have a group yet, uh, so there's in the chat, there's at least two people who don't have a, a group. Try to form groups of three or four, and then the Saturday after stage two, that's when your groups are due. And I'm going to look through all of those. And if there's any stragglers, I'll have to sort of manually assign them. So it'd be great if you can self-assort if you can. Um, that, so that's the plan here. I was and feel free to post in the discussion groups uh, or on Slack uh, to try to link up together as well. Go ahead. Sorry, I was looking at the groups people and it said it was locked to join a group um, or like um, create. I don't know if I was, I might be wrong. Right, okay. So yeah, if you click on groups in uh, if the, the groups in Canvas, that's for the groups that I'll create after you guys finalize your groups. So you don't, um, you don't self enroll in groups. Um, I can create for purposes of this midterm, um, like study groups that you can self enroll in that have nothing to do with your final project group. But I am, you know, finalize the actual groups. So, um, so if you're looking for group members or groups, then uh, I would post to the discussions or to the Slack and um, and then and you can do the at channel in Slack, and that'll broadcast a message to everybody uh, in the class. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? And this is all that I've got for you today. So I'm again happy to stick around for a few minutes if you have questions. I'll start office hours officially at 4:30. Happy to take questions there. You can send some emails. But then on Thursday, um, you know, I can't uh, be available for questions because that will be the exam will be available. Okay. And again, there's no answer set between Thursday and Tuesday. So, um, so it's, you know, it'll be the exact same exam Thursday as in Tuesday, no answer set, no help from me in between those, but plenty of help from each other. Yeah, and take a take a look at the study materials. There's a good, good archive there. Um, the, uh, and there's a question about the format. The, um, the exam is Canvas based. So um, there's going to be a combination of like, matching, uh, there's, it's all auto graded. So, um, and you won't know your score either. I can't release that because that kind of is like a hidden way of giving your, your scores. Um, so in between the two tests, you won't know your score. You'll know your score after the second test. Uh, but, uh, but so they're all auto graded canvas type things. So they might be fill in the blank. There might be multiple choice. There might be matching. Uh, there might be some formula questions, um, but, um, but they're all gonna be things that can be auto graded inside canvas. All right, no problem. Any other questions? All right, good luck. And I'll go ahead and end the meeting. So last call. All right, I'll start office hours in a couple of minutes.